All right, Luke Bateman. Luke. This is called red, green, blue. And it lives up to its name. Um, Shall I read? Sure. If you want. I can read this, sure. Luke Bateman, uh, the title is RGB and it's acrylic on canvas, three canvases. My work revolves around the visible light spectrum and its effect on human emotion. Using color and light and by controlling the re refraction of light from the painting's surface, I manip manipulate the field of vision. I believe a viewer should come to their own conclusions about art and be given ample opportunity for personal reflection. Through saturated color, I create pops of emotion. With desaturated color, I create depth and contemplation. The contrast of the two take the viewer to an imagined space, a place where their thoughts can flash, jump, and spin, just as the colors do in my paintings. This space is a combination of the physical and metaphysical world, shaped in part by each individual observer. Well, I obviously chose this because of light spectrum, color spectrum, but I love the way they he put it together and the, just the, the painting of it as well. The whole beauty of the colors. And your dad, Bud, used to use multiple canvases, right? <laughs> yep. and, and a lot of primary colors some in some cases, right? Yep. <laughs> And attach them together so there might be a, an affinity to that construction Although i don't think i read it as three panels in, in the oh really in the piece itself they, okay i have to say a lot of them do look very different than they did in the slides yeah it must be yeah it's a challenge to to judge uh and jury digitally but it's it's uh it's also rewarding because then you can discover something new right? in person but yeah i think i think the description was quite very good, much, very good. Luke. Right on. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Luke. So let's see. The next one is Deborah. okay, Deborah. So we'll do the book first, and might need to get a couple of angles on this. This there's a w window that goes through each page of this black book that has these hairy. Um, Looks like we have Deborah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, have these strings. Wow. <laughs> and I can maybe turn even the easel or the, the pedestal so you can see inside. Thank you, Benton. It's so hard with a black piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it is, but we'll, we'll move around. Maybe you could say a few words about it as we kind of tour the piece. Sure. Um, I'm so honored and thrilled to be in this show um, and uh, at this wonderful museum. And I just have to say really quickly that I was stunned to see Mark Chester, who I had met decades ago in San Francisco, was in the show. And I reached out to him and had been so struck when I met him briefly so many years ago by his photography and his business card, which I kept that I had remembered. And um, so we're in touch and I'm gonna have to, I'm looking forward to staying on until the end to see Mark's work. So that's just a little plug from Mark. Um, I work, <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to support each other. It's not hard. That's um, right. <laughs> I'm based in the LA area. Um, I'm um, at 18th Street Art Center in Santa Monica, um, local artist in residence. And um, I've been working in the form of the book for about five years, um, but I've had a relationship to bookmaking and uh, and teaching bookmaking for for a long time, both here um, in Los Angeles in the Bay Area, um, and I'm really driven by um, the physical contact with the materials. Um, I'm motivated by the form of the book and um, the implications of the book. But I also work very, very conceptually. Um, when I teach, I just teach basic forms. But in my own work, it's really more conceptual sculpture that still is loosely tethered to the book 
as a structure, but also moves into boxes and other constructions. So when I created this work, I, I had been working primarily in monochromatic whites and off-whites, and I wondered what it would be like to work in black. It's very, very different. Um, and every black material is a different color of black. Um, but I've been exploring how the different chords and strings fall um, and hang and are knotted. And I noticed when I had start cutting the windows, which I guess you can't see in this view, and I started to put the strings down that they look like bars and the whole idea of the title maximum security sort of came together from that. And um, all this was done before COVID um, and George Floyd and a lot of these other um, terrifying things that have happened over the past year, year and a half. I think it definitely references um, a sense of a prison that we perhaps felt through having to stay in with the pandemic and also um, the Black Lives Matters movement and the high level of incarceration of people of color. So the title I think resonates out in a lot of different directions, but um, the windows and the page, the uh, windows um, correlate through the pages and the cover. So you see through it and um, you see the different strings um, hanging and then they sort of become free when they hit um, the pedestal surface. Yeah, um, I love that about the inside out of this piece that you really need to walk all the way around it to to feel it. And then it's a it's a book telling a story in an abstract way of that, of everything that you were just talking about. Um, but I love the tactile feeling that you're you're getting the story through in this very tactile manner. I really like that. In using just monochrome, um, yeah. because, you know, correlating different materials in the same hue um, or the same color of field, but they they work together in different ways because of how they reflect so the light and um, it, it becomes very visceral. That's what I'm, I think, most interested in is the tactility and the visceralness and uh, something that, you know, is a form that relates to words in terms of what we conceive of as a book, but tells a story kind of going beyond words. It's a, a dark chapter that I'd like, <laughs> yes. I'd like to uh, try to uh, rewrite at some point. But thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. It's an honor. So, so next but, up. Yeah, behind it we have, uh, and we're going to try to be a little expedient with some of these because we are running well over our time. So we'll just uh, just try to keep our movement, even though we, we are over. The number, let's see, we're up to 40. 40. We still have some to go. So this is called The World is Over If You Want It. And it's, let's see. Who's Jennison the, and Ryan Montgomery. Right. Is this a husband-wife team? Hello. Same, same person, actually. Hi, how are you? Oh, okay. Actually, I'm realizing I have Ryan written on my Zoom here. Um, the, the short story with that is the... Uh, Jackson Pollock's first name was Paul. <laughs> um, Sanderson is, is the preferred. Um, and I'll try to be articulate. First of all, thank you, um, Benton and Grace, um, for including me in the show. Um, I know, Benton, you'd asked me um, if it was a reference to the John Lennon and Yoko Ono um, famous War is Over poster, uh, which it is, um, and it's a bit of, um, still haven't found the, the best word for it. I, I know I mentioned to you a parody um, or an update, um, but it relates to um, an idea I'm really interested right in, in right now, which is sort of this idea of there being a loss of future, um, this term hauntology um, that I think comes originally from Jacques Derrida, but has been taken up um, by other contemporary um, philosophers, but this idea of sort of a nostalgia um, that we live inside of. Um, so I'm very interested in that, which is part of why, um, you know, I 
had the gall to think I could um, parody John and Yoko. Um, and, you know, color is important here too. Um, theirs was black and white. Um, theirs was war is over. Um, mine is world is over, um, but it's the if you want it part. Um, right. it, it that brings really- the, it brings the, the viewer into the equation that it's, it's partly their decision that there it's not nothing is uh dis determined yet and that uh, that we all have a say in in what the outcome will be so i like that about it yeah even the, the text has a cyclical feel to it right you know thank you yeah that and and listen to what deborah was just saying um it's a lot of uh similar concerns um and and kind of a general um yeah, that uh, sort of ownership, um, that responsibility that we all have um, to the future, you know, whether that's in regard to um, the social struggles that are ongoing or the, you know, the what sometimes can feel almost insurmountable um, issues of climate change or even something like nuclear, uh, you know, the possibility of nuclear winter and and um, you know the 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 um, the need for the the world to come together um, to you know or even with COVID um, you know that so clearly we're still thinking as these nation states but what needs to happen um, is some sort of um, you know, agreement to be reached as a species um, to solve some of these. So yes, that that um, trying to ask the individual or the collective um, to take some ownership over those issues is, is definitely um, what I was thinking about. Time to um, come together. Wonderful. Okay. So, thank you and so thank much. you again. I really appreciate yeah. it. So we're going to jump quickly to Diane Scotty because I know she has to leave and I'm sorry that uh, it's um, running a little beyond the time frame, but we'll try to get everybody in here if we can. This is a piece called um, Optic Optician's Dream. It's multimedia, but I can see that it's made from uh, glass uh, monocles and uh, different instruments that a opt optometrist might use maybe a hundred years ago and they're painted. Um, Hi Diane. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here and so honored is, considering how many applicants there were. <laughs> this is a very playful piece. Yeah. Um, yes it is. It is. There's, and there's a lot going on. Um, it was Definitely. so hard to choose imagery, um, you know, for the lenses. Um, I've got some really, some, you know, political things, obviously with what's going on in the world today, it's kind of hard to stay away from it. Um, so I've got Ruth Bader Ginsburg in there and Martin Luther King. Right. So I consider them so that so my title is basically, you know, ex extinct rare and wonderful things. And um, so I consider those two, two images uh, specifically in all three categories. They're rare because, you know, and they're extinct now because they're no longer with us. And they're just rare, unique human beings and absolutely wonderful. Um, then there's some, some images of nature um, later slippers. I know when I was growing up, later slippers, you couldn't pick them or touch them because they were considered so rare. Um, hopefully they'll be a lot more abundant today because of that fact. And then there's a playful dodo bird and a unicorn and um, things that touch my heart specifically. But the, um, the piece itself, the, the lenses, it came from this kit I gave my daughter for um, for a birthday and she loved it, but couldn't find use of it. And with her young family said, you know, you hold on to it. And so I held on to it until the show came and I, 
immediately thought of, oh my goodness, I've got all these lenses and insight and glasses and how much more ideal could you get? So I started playing with them and finding ways to, um, to utilize them. And um, the back piece that kind of represents hair is like almost like a mobile. It's just, yeah. it's balancing, right. it's balancing on there very delicately. And I think, you know, that represents our, our nature and our lives and constantly in, you know, delicate balance. Um, That's beautifully put together. It's really well structured well and, and it's elegant and it, you really have to walk all the way around it and see it. It's right. wonderful work. They, so you can see through it and into it and yeah, it's a- And the shadows too are really fun. Perfect with the, the theme. <laughs> Thank yep. you, Diane. Yeah. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. We have Jonathan Ryan and- And this is called Heart to Heart, Cyanotype on Paper. Yeah, there were a few people, it took them a little while to see yep. uh, what was going on in here, but um, oh, we have jo it's Joanna, not Doc. Oh, Joanna, yep, jo Joanna Ryan, thank you. I'm going to read uh, the statement. I am an emerging artist working primarily with Hanotype. Sanotype. Sanotype, the, right, yeah. right, aka blueprints slash sunprints, monotypes, weaving, and embroidery. I approach making with fervor and exploring materials. Oh, looks like we have Joanna. Okay. Hello. Do you want Hello. to jump in? How are you all? Good, good, how are you? Good, good. Yep, so um, Johanna and Al Ryan, I'm in Brooklyn. Um, as you said, the piece is called Heart to Heart. And um, this piece is a cyanotype. And so to create a cyanotype, you need sunlight to expose the image. So I think of this piece not only speaking to the relationship of the two figures in this particular piece, um, the space between them and how their bodies relate to each other, but I also think of this piece as speaking to the relationship between humans and nature. So my hand created the marks um, for the plate that I use sunlight then to expose the image. Um, that left an impression, um, kind of like a ghostly image, a negative of the plate that I created, but I needed the sunlight in order to create this also. Yeah, I, I used to do cyanotype and I was drawn to this, trying to figure out how you got there <laughs> from it. Um, I really loved it. And Thank you. I, again, I like the idea of the, of the people, but they're the, the opposite of them to some degree, like the, the the negative of them, but it isn't quite a negative. So exactly. It has that yeah. Really fun push pull back and forth between that, the negative and the do you do Well, these thank on the you roof? so much. <laughs> Are you on the roof of your? I, I'm picturing you in Brooklyn trying to figure out where to put these, make them. Oh yeah, so actually, I do have one um, room in my apartment where I get enough sunlight. Oh, um, okay. But it changes throughout the season. So in the winter, I really have to plan it very well in order right. to catch <laughs> enough light. <laughs> but now in the summer, I can kind of take it easy now. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, great job. It's a beautiful piece. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be in this show. Great. great. Thank you. Thank you. This is the kind of the humanistic corner. We've got a lot of figures. <laughs> and then there you have, with no exception with the next one here. Um, and this is Evie Herb. Evie uh, Herb. Number two, it's oil on recycled textile. And I was really drawn to that, the yeah. idea of painting on these embroidered or textiled pieces. The surface comes through where there's the painting. Yeah. Uh, I'll read the statement here. The study of the figure is a, a concomitant reminder of the human connection and mortality. In the studio, I find myself constantly aware of the connections between memory, body, and media. Through its mirage of materials, my interdisciplinary works explore the impact of anxiety and trauma on identity and gender expression. Uh, presentations of the human form are created by examining the examination of the dissonance between the psyche and the external 
patriarchal culture. The pliable connections between the physical and physiological are illustrated by the intimacy between the figure and its surroundings. The resulting explorations of mind, body, and healing evoke personal narratives in psycholo psychologically charged environments, questioning the impact of gender and identity on our percep perception of subjective reality. That's a mouthful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I love seeing this in person. Uh, just the, the feeling of it coming out from the embroidery. It's a beautiful painting. And what a great, unique way to make a painting, too. I know. Using a fabric so um, rich with flower and color and texture, and then using it as a canvas and having the figure emerge from the flowers. Wonderful. Great idea. Okay. This is a photograph. Megan Mirasalo. It's uh, Seville, and it's an archival digital print. And who is who do we have? Uh, it's Megan Mirasalo. Mirasalo. All right. Megan Mirasolo creates digital photographs by repeating and layering multiple shots. It's always interesting to see how different photos interact with each other once the opacity is lowered, she says. There are subtle skews in perspective as well as shifts of color and light. Her work can take, work can take on an ethereal atmospheric feel. Recent pieces combine photographs from her travels using both urban and natural landscapes as inspiration. The photos capture the feel of exploring new and unfamiliar settings, if only for a moment. Seville is a photograph that looks out over the city in Spain from the Giralda Bell Tower. 16 by 20 archival digital print combines multiple photographs into one, creating dr a dreamy atmosphere that accentuates the hazy reds, whites, and oranges of the urban landscape. The viewer is transported while glimpsing a maze of narrow streets, rooftops, and swimming pools. This original print is matted in white and has a wood frame with a silver front and white sides. It makes me a little bit uh, dizzy. Dizzy, yeah. yeah. I, I have a hard time kind of staying straight uh, up straight when you. It focus felt in almost on it. like you were looking at something with 3D glasses on. Right. Because it had that depth to it. I really loved it. Right. And it has such a painterly quality to the photography. It does. But you do feel like you're up there looking over everything. So I liked the idea of it as a edge of vision. <laughs> oh. Dana Manoflank. Manoflank. Okay. And this is impermanence mixed media with pigment. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Dana Manoflank's artwork focuses on the changing beauty of nature in the imperm impermanence in our natural world. Her compositions are in the wabi-sabi style, a traditional Japanese aesthetic, which signifies acceptance of uh, transience and imperfections. Her, in her work, she addresses the fragile connections between nature and, the, and human society and, and incorporates wabi-sabi to capture the small and simple beauty of nature. A conscious effort to honor the mundane and incidental is part of her artistic philosophy. She wants the viewer to be drawn into her work and contemplate our fragile connection with nature, as well as the moral weight of our influence on it. And it's a beautiful, again, you had to come see this. It's a tactile, three-dimensional wall piece. It really does have that feeling of sculptural. Yeah, and it shimmers. It's it does. And it feels like water or the assumption of water as the background when it's. And I'm pretty sure the canvas must have been wrinkled into a, <laughs> a, a nest before it was stretched because it has a texture to it too. Beautiful. Okay. We have Penny, Stanty, Woven Wave, Oil and Linen. 
Yeah. Penny is with us. Hi, Penny. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, so I'm Penny Santi and I'm from Syracuse, New York. Um, and thank you again for um, having this exhibit and for giving us the opportunity to speak. It's really great hearing everyone. Um, so women are re represented in my work from the authenticity of my own experience, celebrating physical and spiritual strength. And we encounter the vibration of the female energy through sensing the manipulation of paint and color. Um, I really enjoy how brush strokes and marks can speak volumes. And so with this painting, Woman Wave, I was tapping into my experience with bodies of water. Um, I live in an area that has many lakes and I've spent my life on those lakes. My husband and I also spend a lot of time on the shore and we love water sports and enjoy the water in all ways. So to me, being in the presence of water brings peace and space for reflection and joy. So taken from my own experience, I see women and water as, as one. And as I painted this, I pictured the colors, the light, and <clears throat> in that non-linear way that memories have allowed the painting to evolve with the colors and shapes that I recall. Um, representing woman in her fluidity with her natural surroundings is a joyous experience and giving insight into the feminine energy. Um, and, and I also wanted to say that um, I, I created these works as we celebrate the election of our first woman vice president, Kamala Harris. And I feel that women in their spiritual and physical perseverance can be reflected upon with real inspiration for our future. And it's also just beautifully painted. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I love the color and the, the, all of it. I love all of it. Yeah, I'm sure we're on a woman wave that I hope will, right? will build and continue <laughs> in our leadership yes. in, the, in the country Absolutely. and throughout uh, society. So thank you, Penny. Indeed, thank you. Thank you. Um, G.W. Mercure. Mercure. So this is Untitled 2, and it's oil on canvas, and the artist is G.W. Mercure. The work I do in the visual arts is a very modest effort to present narratives too abstract for other media. They're inspired by the works of Barnett Newman, Mark Rothko and Paul Clay. And I have to say, one of the things I loved about this, why I chose it was that line, the, the site down the line that becomes a three-dimensional Right, space. it has texture. Really beautiful. It's the sight line. The sight line, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the color is spectacular. Right, it, it almost looks very simple from afar, but then when you approach it, the colors are very complicated. Very complicated. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. We have Jeff Shyat. Yeah, Jeff Shyat. And this is a aluminum piece. Cadence. It's brushed aluminum called Cadence. My sculpture is about balance, imbalance, and exploration. My work attempts to understand the human condition through discovery of the relationships between its basic components. Yeah. Again, this you gotta go see all the right. Yeah, and, and also I know from the images of his other work that I saw, he works in large scale and I'm sure this is a maquette for- Right, for something much bigger. <laughs> right, something that you might be able to walk underneath. Right. So, 
So this is Marie Shanahan, and it's called Glimmer. Going to pastel. I don't think I got that the first time. Okay. And uh, nature. This is my constant source for inspiration. It is ever changing, and each moment is never the same. It may be a color I see that I have to go home and put down immediately so I don't forget, or it could be a mood that I am trying to capture. At times while in the woods, I will look up and, and a composition is before me that I have to explore. I may play with the ideas in my sketchbook or sometimes I just have to get it on my easel. Once at the easel, I let go and react to the painting as it evolves. My paintings tend to come out with a sense of moodiness, whether that is my intent or not. That's definitely what I got from it was the, the mood of, of the landscape. Attitude. Yes, we weren't exactly sure if it was, you know, fire burning or just the sun coming out. I can just see the artist engaged in making this piece and how it almost must have been a dance where they're they're <laughs> moving and, and and jumping and and dancing with this this yep. piece of paper in order to get the, the final result. Wonderful. So we have Megan Michael. Yes, let's see. Um, as an artist, I see myself as a hunter, a seeker on a treasure hunt to discover and reveal that which is real and raw. My images are not fabricated. I find my images or they find me. What presents itself through my lens is how, communi how life communicates with me. Sometimes life communicates in a very gritty and in very gritty and odd images, and other times it's rainbows and butterflies. No matter how gritty or how pretty the image, they are always honest. So there's a little reflection here, but you can see that this is an underwater view of somebody swimming above, which has a little ominous meeting here on Cape Cod these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have the pool light. <laughs> there right. are sharks involved. But there might also be some digital play. Um, play on this as well. Yeah, I love the feeling of the of the swimming and the night and the light. Yeah, the color in this photograph is beautiful as well. Wonderful. Okay. So I have Libby. I don't have this person. Um, do we... Maybe we start on the other side? I uh, try to find them. Let's see, Karen Dobin, do we have her anywhere? I'm here. Oh, hi, Karen. Great. Hi. How are you? Uh, I would like to say, first of all, as an art history educator, I'd like to compliment you and Grace on a really wonderful show. It's diverse, it's beautiful, and I really am flattered to be part of it with all these wonderful artists. Uh, I'm currently in Florida, but I live in Massachusetts on the North Shore of Boston and hope to get there to see the show this uh, spring. Um, well, we hope to see you here too. <laughs> thank you. So most of my paintings are in sight. <laughs> They are spontaneous internal renderings of just gestural mood, emotion. My, my gestures are really, truly just come at random moments and ways. Um, I meditate a great deal and then get to work. And my first few large, lots of color and sort of dictate what the rest of my palette is going to be. I would love to be living with this painting. It, it really captures <laughs> again that that dance I was talking about where you really must be uh, fully engaged and uh, you know engaged with the process and it comes through with the colors and the, the different markings you make with from drips to swaths of color to to line drawings and even prints I see in there too. It's very yes. joyful. Very uh, spontaneous yes. joy. 
Well, during COVID, I've tried to remain uh, colorful and joyful and these dances that I do with the paint are really meant to be positive and to have a good outlook. So well, let's well, hope we, we well can done. yeah we can all <laughs> break free from this COVID soon yeah. and we'll see you yeah. in Massachusetts. Absolutely. Yes, thank you very much for including me in the exhibit. Well thank safe you. safe travels. We'll see you. Yes, thank you. Okay. So we have Libby Ellis. Right. Do we have Libby? Hi, Libby. Hi. Just need you to unmute yourself. That's all. So yeah, there's this is a photograph from Libby. This. Yep, I'm unmuted now. There we are. Okay. Hi. 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 Thank you for having me. Thank you for being there. So um. I'll just say briefly, um, I work in black and white photography and I create, well, I would say I co-create with the flowers, contempl contemplative portraits. Uh, um, I'm an inward traveler <laughs> and I just follow the flowers. And um, the one thing I'll say about this piece is that the the eye like form in it is a pod from another po poppy that was standing above it and in the morning when i woke up the pod had broken open and fallen into the cup of the lower poppy oh, and um so it's not uh, uh there it's all nature's intention it's not my it's not my hand arranging i'm not into that that's, that's not my jam no. that's also, it yeah it's also not mammalian it almost looks like hair <laughs> yeah yeah it's true a really beautiful print as well i just have to say as a as a photographer I and mean, it's just a beautiful print on top Thank of everything you. i love the the kismet of the eye falling in but it is, like you said, it's a very uh, sensitive portrait of a flower. I think, uh, you know, they have a lot to tell us. They do. You just have to listen. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Libby. We have Mark Brennan. Yeah, Mark Brennan is this construction wood block block box here with, I see Mark. Hello, Mark. Wow, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, thanks. Uh, just seeing all this amazing work. Uh, you know, I'll be on the Cape in two weeks and can't wait to get in there personally and great. see it all in the flesh. It'll be great. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about your piece. Well, it's kind of a dialogue between two different things. Uh, one voice being the, uh, the painted part, which is the, the oil on paper, which is the ocean. And then the other part being the box. And the ocean sort of expands outward centrifugally and the box contains it. So there's kind of a, a conflict between the two elements. Instead of just being a picture with a frame, which is more like, a, like an article of clothing that would be on a human, this is more like two things where the, the frame is not just a frame, but actually an equal voice in the, the kind of partnership between um, painting and kind of support. Containing and, the uh, ocean, it's not easy. Right? <laughs> I like the well, word dialogue. That's a really very apropos. I I love yeah, how I was you presented Sorry. it, you know. Uh, listening to uh, Jessica Larva a little bit earlier, and I was thinking, oh my goodness, you know, uh, she's sort of coming from some of the same places I am, and there's an interesting kind of interaction between her piece and mine as well, in some ways. Uh, you know, I submitted to the the whole idea of insight because the the whole spark for this body of work came from kind of a an epiphany I had in a way 
maybe that's too strong a word, but of uh, just standing in front of the ocean and one day just realizing, holy smokes, you know, this thing is just immense. It's so vast. And you look out at that horizon and you're thinking, oh man, that's just miles and miles and miles. But really uh, at a certain point you realize, well, that, gosh, that's only about 10 miles away. And that water goes on for thousands and thousands of miles before you come to land again. And it made me realize that just our mind, you know, just it's, it's really not as strong as we think it is. It's uh, it, our imaginations really just can't get around that idea of that immense size, that kind of vastness. And it's, uh, it's just as it's uh, also very deep, just like the frame that you have it on. So <laughs> the, the ocean is not only vast, but nobody can fathom its depths uh, properly. Yeah, that you know, you, you hear, can hear numbers that it's it's so many fathoms deep, it's so many wi miles wide. But all you see in your head really is a number with a lot of zeros. In terms of <laughs> actually wrapping your mind around it and, and understanding it, uh, you made sort of it, <laughs> it, 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 it can't happen. Yeah, you made it manageable and put it in a box for us. I like that. Yeah, I sort of uh, originally, I was going to do uh, an ocean picture that really captured the size of it, the vast space, uh, but they don't sell canvas or paper that's 3,000 miles long, so <laughs> I had to go the opposite direction and see how small I could make it, and this one I think is about four or five inches, but I got them down to the point where I could actually do them three inches wow. and, uh, and still have it look pretty much like, like the ocean in the sky. Great. Well, we'll see you when you get to the Cape. Yes. Thank you. For yeah. Uh, nice to uh, meet both of you in person at some point. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Is it going? No. All right. We have Tracy Wascom. The remnant series. So this is a uh, remnant number nine, and it's archival digital print on plexiglass. And yeah, okay. So this is uh, Tracy Watcom from the remnant series. We know there is beauty to be found within fragments of the quote uh, quotation. I guess it's instead of quotation, quotation, a quiet, deceptive, sublime that rubs up against the familiar yet often overlooked. An evocation of meditation, not bound by the dramatic, but informed by the poetic. Amidst this introspective consideration, subtle discomforts may emerge in the identification of the commonplace triggers of one's aesthetic response while we simultaneously find ourselves inexorably enticed by the lure and seduction of lint and hair and dirt. So as you can see, this is a, a close-up of what we might find in the corner of a cupboard underneath the, <laughs> the cupboard. And it's kind of celebrating that, I think, in, in a way, by putting it front and center. It's a beautiful print and it's um, it's hard to tell, but it's printed like with glass. I don't know if it's on the glass or right behind the glass. Um, but I loved just the the idea of putting this remnant on this, you know, leftover things that people aren't paying attention to and putting it on a pedestal. It's almost like when people started to paint the working class instead of royalty, there was a, always this acknowledgement of how a common person is is worth celebrating and in, in a way this remnant of dust is just as beautiful as a landscape really beautiful i like the transition from this to these two we'll get them both in the picture here yeah another two i couldn't choose between this is andrew young hello andrew hello how are you hello. all we are well Good. I really love your collages. Well, thank you very much. That means a lot to me for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm in Midtown today, Manhattan, but I feel like I am over the moon. Uh, my mother was from a Cape Cod family. 
I was glad to hear fathoming right now because I've been thinking about fathoming, which I consider Insight's sister, since a friend described push and pull that way. I find the double meaning of depth and understanding exquisite, irresistible in the context of seafaring Cape Cod. Insight and fathoming are bonded in duality, tension, and balance, but which flows from which? Like river and bay, they interchange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the two of these interchange too. But thank you, Grace. I, uh, I have to say, uh, probably unbeknownst to you, because how would you know we've never met, but your father and my mother uh, were friends. Oh, I, wow. <laughs> and well, I, I know met Dad your- I friends with Jack Twerka, for sure. What's from, that? I know Dad and Jack were friends in Provincetown. You had well, written about I, him in your statement. Only because I'm reading his book. I, I, ah. uh, uh, I'm from, uh, I'm from a, a Truro family. And I met your father at our house in the 1980s. Uh, so, but thank you very much. And the uh, one on the top uh, does play on, uh, I've been reading uh, uh, Tworkoff and uh, it plays on some, a, a review of Tworkoff's show in 2002 talked about, Harry Cooper talked about cracks of light. Yeah. And I just was struck by that and, and actually Torkov's collages. And then, so I did the one on the top and I was doing that. And then I, uh, I actually saw the, it, it, I saw the Pamet River in it. And I thought, well, oh. gosh, that's, that's uh, so the one below it is uh, more specifically the Pamet River, which was my uh, grandmother's view late in life as she sat on the porch, I would say fathoming very much. Nice. They also have a, a Myron Stout thing going on. I don't know if you've looked into him, but another uh, wonderful Cape Cod artist. <laughs> I have. I've, I, I've been drawn to this whole thing by a, a study of an unknown artist who studied with Hoffman, and I've been at it for about 16 years. Uh, and right. it's just been, uh, it's, it's taken me in this direction, which is uh, super fun. And uh, I, 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 I will say that I'm profoundly uh, moved by being part of this show at this place. <laughs> and Great. it's a We're pleasure. The pleasure is ours. Thank you so much for being part of the exhibition, and we really enjoy your the simplicity and the beauty of your pieces. Thank you very much. I'm going to finish uh, the selection here, um, Grace is as uh, previous engagement. So it's going to be myself for the last five pieces. Um, and we have Mary, Mary Arthurs. And let's see if she is here. She says, my work explores cycles of life, death and regeneration. I seek to discover intimacy in the understated so that I may reflect back to the viewer on their own imagined unknowable space. Working from my personal experiences, the recent death of my father, the discovery of a peculiar landscape, all while conscious of my aging body and history, I turn to the presence of the ordinary to point to temporary temporality that which eventually vanishes and all that remains. To beckon moments to stay, look and linger is for me to reveal a mysterious lens tinted by loss. So obviously the, um, there is a person in this image counting rings of a tree and that speaks very directly to these cycles of life and death that Mary is uh, speaking of in her description. I think it's a great way of illustrating the connection 
having a, a senior hand counting the rings of a, a tree that obviously no longer is with us because it's cut, but the cycles are all the same and we all will end up in the same place. So I think that provides some insight into our human condition. I'm gonna continue here. Uh, there are two pieces here by Mary Doring, and she is, looks like she's joining us today. Hello, Mary. Hi. Hi. I'm very happy to be here. I, my husband and I saw the exhibition last week, and it's really beautiful. I'm very grateful to Grace and to the museum for having my work. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And you're okay. looking at... Yeah, we can see this print here. It's when the moon in the seventh, when the moon is in the seventh house. Yes, um, I'll just read my uh, artist statement. I think that might be helpful. Current events this year propelled me to work on images that reflect the polarization of our political environment. Using color and composition, I created prints that give a sense of imminent danger and potential harm. I also created images that project a feeling of hope. Living through the 60s and the turbulence of those difficult years, I have great confidence in our ability as a nation to survive difficulty. I am optimistic that as human beings, we can begin to hear the rational voices of peace and cooperation, which will lead us out of this darkness. So um, this is from the... Um, uh, the song, when the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter collides with Mars, then right. peace will guide our planet and love will steer the stars. Um, I work intuitively. I um, do all of my work as a combination of my own photographs and my own drawings and um, other a mishmash of things I put together um, in the computer. So that's what I came up with. And um, I'm particularly fond of this one because I think it's both peaceful and dynamic in what's going on. Yeah, the combination of subtle shapes and tones with the, the very precise lines and um, distinctive shapes, uh, I think that contrast really helps you kind of feel the, the texture that you, you're achieving with your digital process. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I hear, I feel the, uh, the moon being in the seventh house, house there, maybe in the upper left, a red moon. And yes. uh, yeah, there's some literal and some very abstract ideas that come through. And potentially, I don't know if those are seeds. <laughs> but sowing the seeds in a full moon? Yes, um, they're, they're interpreted by, by, other, by a lot of people by other things, but um, they are thinking of seeds for the future and um, cooperation and how we work together. And on the other side of these sculptures we'll get to next is Mary's other piece. And that um, is called the Eve of Destruction. And it also has a moon in it. And um, sometimes this year, it's very frustrating, but it felt actually very therapeutic to go up in my studio and just scribble black marks on paper. And uh, so this is an overlay of scribbled black marks over, um, somebody was trying to replaster a wall and I had photographed that at some point. So these two are combined. And I called this Eve of Destruction because I think about all the people who were about to attack the Capitol and what they were thinking of the night before and how tumultuous that the thoughts and the anger. Um, and I tried to make an um, image that would somehow reflect that. Yeah, the, the emotion is very powerful in this piece. And now that you mentioned that you've, you've taken a kind of a raw bare wall that's being repaired. 
in the image of that and and then has have uh, altered it with these what are, are appear like scribbles but they you know it's there's some uh, harmony in them even though they're they seem random I find uh, I find them to have some balance and some um, you know that there's a mark there that's not just random I can see there's there's thought and, and uh, processes as you're controlling your mark. Yes, I agree. <laughs> but it's, but it's, it still it's also, is cathartic. <laughs> it's it's also it's also wonderful that you can use your artistic uh, expression to help you kind of digest what has happened. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Mary. All right, thank you. I really appreciate being in the show. Thanks very much to both of you. It's our pleasure. We hope to see some more of your work. Okay. So we have Jakob Ulin, and he's here. Uh, it looks like zooming in. And I tried to get three spots on it, Jakob, as you were hoping for, but um, I don't know if I'm living up to your expectation, but I think it looks quite lovely here. Uh, that's kind of you, Benton, I appreciate it. And my name's Jakob Kulin, I'm a Boston-based sculptor. Um, uh, it's obviously a pleasure to be with you all and Grace and Benton, thank you very much. Um, with regards to my work, um, I, my works don't really need or have specific meaning, but there's definitely a visual language that I work with in, in a number of my works. And I start off with studies and those studies lend insight into line, form, shadow, shape. And in this particular piece titled 360, the, the idea was that I wanted to kind of have a subtle play uh, of color of this uh, rich rusted tone of the steel uh, next to the the oxidized black steel rods that come off the work and then I also wanted to play with the depth so as you can see from the shadow is cast from a front perspective the depth is 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 given up you understand and from a side view which the viewers can't take in obviously it's, uh, we, it's, can, we can try we can try <laughs> we're on our um, so so it's uh, and the lighting. This the, this piece involves um, three squares. It's a triptych, and each square there's 120 rods. Those rods are about an eighth inch in, in outer diameter. And I wanted to play around with this subtle transition or shift from square to circle. And so my my point of contact with the steel bases is it is on the wall, and then they they protrude off the wall significantly up to about 10 inches. And when you look at the work under light, you can see that subtle in the left piece there, you can see the subtle ring. So the light is, is casting shadow, obviously. And so there's this double layer of positive form and then the weave of the shadow behind it. So I, I really look to just let my works kind of speak a visual language of their own and in, for some people, it will resonate in different ways. And this was just a piece that I decided that I wanted to, to do. And, and this was the final outcome of my, my thoughts and, and what I wanted to kind of balance with regards to square to circle and then subtle color and, and form shift. Well, it's, it's a, a, like you said, a, a great transition from square to linear to circle and the um, connection to insight I think is is there also even if it wasn't intentional I think there's uh, something ocular about it and um, absolutely you know. I just one final note if uh, Benton I know that you you only can do so much with certain lighting but if if there were a, a hot spotlight or a light put on these the notion was this ocular wanting to bring the viewer into the piece through these kind of 
these circular forms, obviously, that are very obvious, but to want to investigate further inside of them. So right. you, you have the pulled back view and then this light circle that's cast on the rust, it kind of brings you in to want to further investigate. So there was that notion of insight. Yeah, I have uh, some lights on my camera here that I can't <laughs> turn off. And so they kind of, uh, they mute the shadows a little bit, but. Um, you can but, see, you, you can get an idea though of what it's doing. Yeah. Well, they are intriguing and they're uh, quite the centerpiece that you can see from all across the gallery from, from through this opening and it's uh, framed by the doorway here. So it's, it's quite a, a, a dramatic centerpiece. So thank you, Jakob. Thank, thank you. And I would just like to say thanks to all my fellow colleagues out there. Keep creating. <laughs> Great. You too. And hopefully we'll see you in the museum when you come and, and take a look personally. We'll do so and look forward. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. We've got Kimberly, uh, and this is Kimberly Bala, float on glass. It's oil metallic pigment, pigment on panel. And Kimberly Bala, by mixing various painting mediums, I have developed a blend of liquids which chemically, chemically react to each other to create unique patterns and contours. Over the past seven years of working with my, fond, my found technique, I have come to know and harness my mysterious process as my own. I am mesmer mesmerized by this magical chemical approach, which captures a natural process freezing in time, freezing it in time. Continually drawn to a technique that seems to touch on the endless cycle of nature and existence, the cycle of building and breaking down materials to form textures which externally exist in the universal reality of nature and consciousness. I focus on these patterns in geologic textures which seem oddly familiar with the intent to create an otherworldly intimacy. I wish for my work to create a void into a world which seems familiar yet unfamiliar and encourages the discussion of the micro macro makeup of life and distant realities and an invitation to study beyond the world and wonder. So as you can see here, there's a, lo uh, a lot of chemistry involved in this process and um, we, a lot of our people are familiar with the paint pouring techniques where you have oil and water and um, uh, oil-based and water-based materials and they react in uh, very organic ways. And there's some of that happening, um, but there's also some very controlled elements. You've got the rectangular frame on the bottom that continues up the side combined with a circular form. And so I think the combination gives you structure within this, wouldn't call it chaos, it's almost like a fractal imagery where you let the materials uh, express themselves. And so the uh, the title float on uh, appears to be the the ring floating on the surface of the canvas. It's on uh, on panel. Okay, that's Kimberly Bala. This piece is by Linda Deep Brenna. 
zoom in here a little bit and straighten things out. So this is a screen in front of a black and white photograph. So it's a brass screen with tacks and a, a deep frame. And the photograph depicts a, a woman, a young woman who's also uh, has their vision augmented as the screen augments our vision of her. Let me read Linda's statement. Uh, in, in, interdisciplinary artist Linda DeFrena creates inspirational artworks in which the process is as equally important as the concept. The images are curious, mysterious, and unexpected, pulling at the viewer's emotions. The very act of photographing for the artist becomes a meditative state of mind and being. It is an interaction between the subject and the photographer, a wedge of space and time captured in a split second inside a camera. Photography is combined with mixed media such as metal, wood, nails, barbed wire, glitter, etc., resulting in alternative ways of presenting photography. Linda Field's imaginative approaches to making art produced, produce sensations and emotions she remembers experiencing as a child. Play freely with paper, paint, scissors, ink, wire, or any material without thought of right or wrong is joyful. This artist grants herself the freedom to move between the transitional image, processes, and materials to alternative approaches and materials. So I think there's probably a number of interpretations and I'm not sure I should put forth any one in particular because in, in some um, cases, it's nice to have the open-ended uh, understanding and let the viewer decide. But I think the, you know, the overarching idea of having your vision, it's in interesting, it's an exhibition called Insight and, and the site is being augmented or obstructed um, in this case for the viewer looking in and the viewer looking out. I think that can speak to things that we experience every day, but also maybe something that pertains to uh, contemporary state of affairs being kind of locked inside and uh, separated from others. Okay. This is Helen Stracco. Hi. Hello, Helen. Helene. Helene, oh. Yeah. Hi, Benton. How are, how are you today? Good, how are you guys doing? It's it's four o'clock. You guys I know. holding up okay? <laughs> uh, I know, we're actually almost to the end. I know. It's, it's been an, an enjoyable run through and it's great to spend time with each of these works. And it is, I've enjoyed some of it. Um, I haven't been on the whole time, but it's been wonderful. And I'm, I'm so thrilled to be invited to be in the show. So thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Well, can you tell us a little bit about this um, this woven hand dyed uh, artwork that you created? I can read um, the statement, or you can read it. Um, um, I can read it. I have it here, and I'm just going to read it because I'm not really great at speaking um, extemporaneously. So, um, what I wrote was, as a weaver and a hand dyer, I chose color and pattern with weft based e tap tapestry to interpret the concept of insight for the Cape Cod Museum of Arts exhibit. And the name of this piece is Realization. For realization, the creative process involved measuring the weft yarn, which is the yarn that goes back and forth horizontally um, to match the width of the warp. And that's the width of the whole piece. And the warp goes up and down. The pattern is preserved by wrapping the weft with ECOT tape. And this is ECOT tape here. Okay. It's, it's, it's kind of like a tie dye. Um, 
process. Um, and then top dyeing the whole piece. So the piece started off gold. I wrapped the design um, and then top dyed it with the red, uh, with the red dye. Um, Interesting. The design grows as the weaving advances. So it's, it's taped off pretty, um, um, not precisely. So it's get an idea of the design um, to begin with. The design uh, grows as the weaving advances. Each tapestry woven in this manner, and I, I weave a lot of tapestries this way, seem to, each tapestry woven in this manner seems to define its own intention. Patterns that are self-evolving demonstrate that the piece can conjure its own meaning as it takes form. With creative imprecision, the weaving advances slowly taking on a rhythmic design that translates with its own insight. So I wasn't quite sure when I wove this, what was gonna happen because the yarn is one continuous strand and it's, it's dyed in place. And then I wind it onto my shuttle and then weave. And, and as the dyed pieces appear, like as you're weaving it, it gets packed in and it forms the design. And it's always a surprise to see how it, how it comes out. <laughs> do, do other people work this way? I haven't really heard of top dyeing or dyeing while it's no, in the... I, um, I learned this device quite a while ago from a woman named Mary Zikafus, and she's much more precise about where she, where she tie dyes, where she puts her design. Um, um, I, I like to be surprised more. Um, and it gives me insight. It gives me, um, it gives me surprise. It gives me, it's a, it's a very happy way to, um, very happy way to, to weave. And it's not very stressful. I don't have, a lot of times weaving you place um, segments of yarn, specific colors in specific places. And you have to be very precise. And um, that's not my style. Well, there's a native, um, uh, maybe a Native American look to it for me somehow, or a Mexican possibly. Um, sure. But also the, the, the central focus of it, I think is, is uh, very compelling. It draws you into the, in the piece. And at the same time, um, the fact that it, it's kind of a small tapestry mounted on on a canvas makes the function uh, purely artistic. Right. And, and so that is also intriguing because many people think of, of something woven as, as utilitarian. And so right. it brings it out of the utilitarian realm and into the visual art realm. So, and you realized it, realization. Yeah, <laughs> or idea, I just like, bing, you know, um, I, I, anyway. Well, we really appreciate the, the contribution and, and thank you for realizing it for all of us. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for choosing it. It's, it was really a, uh, a thrill. Great. Okay, Beautiful. Helene. Okay. Take care. Bye. This is a piece by Mark Chester. Mark Chester um, has exhibited here at the museum on occasion. And uh, when he dropped off this piece, I asked him how, <laughs> how and uh, where, and, and this was a, um, in an opera um, in New York in 1974. And it's a man with opera glasses. He said he, he turned around and took this picture of the man behind him at the opera. Uh, and it's perfect for the theme insight. So he said he had to enter it. Um, and yeah, we, we really enjoy the direct connection to insight with this visual imagery of the, of the term. Uh, Mark Chester says, I learned to be a photographer looking at images at museums, magazines, and books. I'm self-taught learned in the field. As a youngster, I had a penchant for discovering new places and meeting people. National Geographic magazines were my guides. The wanderlust and curiosity remain alive today as during my youth in the 50s. Interesting 
what paths our lives follow. I could have become a travel agent. Instead, I became a travel photographer. For 45 years, I explored countries in Asia, Europe, South America, and South, the South Pacific, photographing cultural landscapes. They are pictures of people, places, and things that have touched me in some emotional, intellectual, and whimsical way. Taking photographs is like driving a car, always looking ahead to the side and behind. Don't take photos, be taken, uh, don't take photos, be taken by your pictures, said Ernst Haas, an influential photographer. The Insight exhibition allows for an inter interpretation of the world itself, insight, insight and insight. What a fun challenge. And the, those were all spelled differently, insight, in space site and insight, I-N-C-I-T-E. So, um, so thank you, Mark, for your photograph. And this is um, was part of the Tusum um, book that uh, that Mark has with uh, images of his work. And the final work today is. Laura Shabbat. And Laura teaches here at the Cape Cod Museum of Art. And she also um, is a, a wonderful artist, teaches other places, and uh, has some push pull in her background. Um, and here she is. Hi, Laura. Hi, Benton. Congratulations. I'm the last one. <laughs> well, it, it's really a joy. I, 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 you know, to put everything together is one thing, uh, you know, receive it and to, to physically handle it and to assemble it, but to, to get to explore it mentally and conceptually is really where it's at. And so it's been a, it's been a great afternoon. I've truly enjoyed being a part of it. And uh, you know, you and Grace have really encompassed art history and theory. And uh, I really love Grace's logic regarding how she selected work. And I love the way that you installed it. It's beautiful. Um, I certainly miss teaching uh, you know, in person and hope to do it again. But I wanna talk about Hoffman just for a minute. Many people talked about him and he's such an influence for us on the Cape, right Benton? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah because so many of the teachers uh, that uh, now on the Cape that are older in their 80s uh, and 70s studied with him directly. And I've studied with Robert Henry, who was your Muse Award winner last year. Right. And in what happened to me during the COVID was, you know, I had been making paintings and you know my work and I've been making, making paintings uh, from life that had to express something that I wanted to say, but in COVID, because we had to shift over to Zoom and I spent a lot more time with myself than other people, I've started to want the paint to express. So it's a difference in orientation from subject matter to the paint is the thing, or that wonderful term that's so confusing, plasticity. But I feel I've really achieved that in this piece and that I'm off in a new direction uh, this is a self-portrait and, uh, you know, quite obviously I look like that. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I did was abstracted myself and picked out the essence of myself during this time and uh, working in one small studio in our house versus, you know, jet jetting from place to place on the Cape as, as we used to do when we'll do again. Well... I've often been thinking about you and up in Provincetown and, and how you're faring and looking forward to getting back together and having some more classes at the museum and, Can't and wait. Ce celebrating the, the, the teachers and the, the theory of Hans Hoffman and the push pull and, and using color to, uh, to give depth to paintings. It's, yes. uh, you, you really, express it and live it and breathe it. 
<laughs> I do. And, uh, you know, I just want to, again, uh, just acknowledge the beauty of this show and how much challenge it was to produce it during, you know, our pandemic and just how beautiful of a show. I can't wait to see it when I'm uh, fully vaccinated, which will happen during the, I'll be able to run down and come see the show just in time. <laughs> <laughs> That's delightful. I can't wait until we can all pull off our masks and, and, uh, and gather again and yes. have receptions the way we, we remember them. And in the meantime, we have this wonderful technology, which when it's working, it's very, very nice. But when it's not, it's a very bad, bad child. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're doing our, our best and we're not gonna let it get the best of us. That's right. Um, thank <laughs> you, Benton. Well, thank you, Laura. Take care. You too, have a beautiful evening. and. Okay, so I'm gonna roll back to where we started here. We've made it all the way around. And we're back to 